What up, what up, what up? It's your boy, All The Dialogue. I got a special guest on the line. So if you don't mind, introduce yourself to the people. I'm Mike Mosley, a producer from out of the Bay Area. Let them know some of the artists you produce for. Produced uh, E-40, uh, Richie Rich, uh, TQ was one of my artists, signed out of uh, L.A., and uh, Tupac, of course, uh, Mac Mall, uh, and Sibo, Spice One, Messi Mar, the San Quinn, Sally Cell, Be Legit, you know, mainly a lot of all of the 90s rappers out of the early 90s from the Bay Area. So with that being said, my man, I'm going to get right into it. How did you meet Tupac? Well, I met Tupac uh, at Jack the Rapper in Atlanta. I met him... Uh, at the uh, Marriott Marquis. I was coming up the elevator and he was coming towards, I mean, I was going up the escalator. He was coming towards the escalator. And a friend of mine who was a sky cap, he had worked at the airport in San Francisco. So he would see a lot of celebrities come in and out the airport. So he kind of had a, a slight, you know, uh, relationship or visual relationship with Pop. And so he would talk to Pac about me. And when he seen Tupac, at the convention, he kind of ushered Pac over towards where I was going towards, and then that's how we basically met up at the same time and trying to, you know, at an escalator, you know? Right, right. How did that conversation go when you first met him? Well, when I met him, um, he was just as excited to meet me as I was to meet him um, because he had heard a lot of my work. He had heard a lot of my early stuff, my SIBO and one of his favorite songs was Bailing Through My Hood that, that me and Sam Bossing had produced for Sally Sale. So he had, was familiar with my work. He, you know, his ear was really to the street, so he knew of a lot of work that we had, that I produced. And so he had uh, said that I told him I wanted to work with him because I, at the time I wanted to get a plaque. You know, and I knew that he was he was fresh off that uh, um, Janet Jackson film, that film he did with Janet Jackson, uh, um, Poetic Justice. So I knew he was a huge star at the time. He's from the Bay, and so I'm like, man, I want to work with you. You know, he was like, man, I want to work with you. What's up? You know, he was like, well, I got one more couple songs I'm still working on. I'm gonna be in the Bay next week. So uh, here my number is. Let's meet up. When I come to the Bay, bring me some music. That's when my cassettes were still out. And so he came to the Bay, and I gave him a cassette of the song um, um, "Heavy in the Game." And me and Sam had cooked up a few days before uh, he got there. And so I, I gave him a cassette tape, went down and met with him in, uh, in the Bay. And um, because like San Leandro, somewhere out that way by the airport in Oakland. And uh, gave him a cassette tape. He flew back to um, L.A. And uh, he hit me two, three days later and to scheduled an appointment for me to get picked up by a car and Flew me to LA to produce uh, some more, you know, to produce some more songs. How did that recording session go for Heavy in the Game? So Heavy in the Game, we had actually produced the track before they actually did the lyrics on it. So what happened was um, we produced the track, and then I flew to LA with my equipment, and we tracked it out. And Richie Rich came through there. That was my first time meeting Richie Rich. So I know Richie Rich from Tupac. Tupac introduced me to Richie Rich, even though Richie Rich had been there. He had been a factor in the Bay with the 415 music back in the early 90s. And so, you know, that session was, it was real, you know, quick and easy. You know what I mean? It was, it was like my first professional uh, scenario where I was, you know, I got flown to L.A. And I'm in a real L.A. studio, you know, different from what we're used to up, we're, we're used to up, up in the Bay Area. Everybody waiting on your hand and foot. It just was a whole different environment you know a whole different league of, of doing business you know in a professional way so you know the song was you know i pretty much was you know at the mixing board and it, it went by it went by fairly smooth you know right right so i want to go back a little you said the first time you met tupac was at jack the rapper if i'm not mistaken that's the same day you met left eye right yes same day i met left, left eye um, yeah. And I think Jack the Rapper really was, it was something like a freak nick or something. I don't know if it was the week before or the week of, or Jack the Rapper and the freak nick was the same type of thing. So everybody in the music industry, let alone Atlanta was there. That's the first time I actually seen Snoop, 
That's the first time Death Row was there and Snoop him was fighting with uh, Luke at the time. I don't know what that was about. It was some type of beat between Luke and Death Row. And so it was a big old thing with them at that convention. But it was, it was a real dub. That's the first time I met Buster Rhymes. Um, you know, and I was actually down there with E-40 now. Going to detail about that, Death Row and Uncle Luke had a fight at Jack the Rapper? Yeah, it, it was uh, Jack the Rapper. But I don't know what it, I don't know really know what the beef really was. But there was like this big old, there was this issue. I don't know what it was, but they were like fighting. Somebody was fighting. There was something going on back then with them. And I, I can't really remember what it was, but there was some type of issue where Death Row had a problem with Luke at the time. And I don't know if it was, you know, some of the people from that, that camp got into the fight with the Death Row camp. And, but Death Row was there so deep that they used to walk Snoop around with about five or six bodyguards around him. Back then they were doing that. You know what I mean? At the conventions. They were, Snoop was like a president walking around out there. Uh, but they, you know, they, it was an issue back then. It was like something weird. You know, real, that was the uproar at the convention at the time. How was the interaction like when you first met Left Eye? Well, you know, when, when, um, <clears throat> when you at these conventions, you know, um, you just see, you just meet everybody. So one of my homeboys, uh, Chauncey, Chauncey Banks, he introduced, he, he was already talking to her, standing there talking to her. And he's like, hey, Mike, come over here. I got left eye. And so I went over there and I introduced myself. She's like, yeah, how you doing? You know, just a cordial little introduction thing. And we had a camera. We had her send out a little drop, you know, send a little shot out or something to me. She was talking, you know, she was real cool, though. She was real nice and sweet and, and humble. You know what I mean? Real cool. Down to earth. Um, you know, young lady. You produced Can You Get Away for Tupac, right? Yes. How did that song come about? So, um, what happened with that? Um, he had, you know, he had flew me back to LA once, once again, and um, had me come to the studio. And I got, to, I didn't get to the studio until like two or three in the morning. And uh, and when I got to the studio, there was no equipment there for me to work on. I only had a couple of my pieces of equipment, but they didn't have my APC that I needed. So, Tupac had called the. Um, called, uh, I want to say Tom Wiley, Tom, called Tom Wiley's assistant and was yelling and screaming and cussing people out, telling him, you know, he was real mad and upset. This was like three in the morning. He was real upset that I didn't have all my tools that I needed. So I basically had scraps to work with. So I ended up, they end up, I ended up getting me a guitar player in there. Then I called Ebony. I flew Ebony in, so she didn't get there till like 3.34. Um, I flew her in just to have her come sing on the hook. And, you know, I just was sitting there and I just, something just came back, like, like an old memory of just my mother and my family just playing old songs. And I just came up with the whole Frankie Beverly vibe type song. And Pac just went in there and killed it, you know? What's that song about Left Eye? No. Oh, I don't know. You know what? I don't, he never said, he never said, oh, this is about Left Eye. He just was, he was just was writing and doing stuff. So I don't really know if it was or was it. He was more so, his, his, his vibe at that time he was just on some respectful black woman which he already really was anyway but he was at the time he was facing this right before he went to go to court and he was fighting that case up in new york so he was feeling kind of somber and he was feeling kind of in that space that's why that album felt different from all eyes on me uh album because he was in a different he was in a more subdued kind of chill not really chill but just a humble you know, just uncertain of the future type of a vibe. And he was just more prolific on that album. So he was just, was just letting that side, of his sensitive, sensitive side go, so to, so to speak. So we was talking about all kinds of this, just random stuff. I asked him, you know, what was he doing at the Saturday Night Live with Madonna? Cause I seen a, a video of him. I saw the TV, I saw the show and I just saw him. They did a quick flash and I saw him. He was right there in the audience sitting with Madonna. I'm like, man, what are you doing with Madonna? He was like, what you think I was doing with Madonna? I'm like, oh, okay. He was like, oh, I'm like, yeah. And then we started talking about the whole him and Janet Jackson, how she didn't want him to kiss her. Or she wanted him to take up an AIDS test and that whole thing. So he was, you know, upset about that. But at the same time, he still had respect for women. So he just was on his, you know, his pen game as far as trying to, you know, rap for the women, rap to the women and try and, you know, show them, you know what I mean, that he got respect for them. So that was his vibe when he was doing 
can you get away? You know, I didn't know what he was going to come up with. I just was just, I was just, just so happens we was, that's what brought, I guess, brought that out of when I just came up with that type of track. Uh, happy feeling basically is what I, I reflect that. Out of curiosity, did Tupac ever talk to you about the whole Ayanna Jackson incident? Yeah, he did. He just, he, it was, um, he just was basically telling me that, of course he didn't do it. You know, he was just like, man, I ain't do that. He just didn't, you know, I, it was just one of those basic things that, you know, I went and had sex with the girl. She gave me head on the dance floor. I couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? He was like, man, he, she gave me head on, I thought I was top, on top of the world. You know what I mean? She gave me head on the dance floor, so... I figure, you know, we go back to the room. I have sex with him. I got done. And then my homeboys, you know, and then it basically it, it turned it into a train type thing. You know what I mean? And so, go. Oh. And so, um, so I guess she felt some kind of way afterwards, you know? But looking back at it now, it was something deeper happening. You know what I mean? <laughs> looking at what everything else that came out, but that's just what he told me, which is he didn't really, he didn't mean no harm, but he just felt like she just was, acting like that because you know what I mean she just thought that they were supposed to be together or something you know when he like man would you give me head on the dance floor so anything goes at this point you know so he didn't he didn't like be like y'all come in y'all rape you know it wasn't no rape type thing she just was acting like a toss up basically you know <laughs> so he just you know he handled his business and you know he, he might have asked her you know can, can my homeboys whatever whatever you know what I mean she was like yeah come on so Stretch and you know what I mean. All the other cats, the other dudes, chose around. You know they had sex with her too. So then, but she gonna point him out. You know, so he was just like in disbelief that it was happening to him. You know, right, right. So um, you produced. Can you get away and heavy in the game for the Me Against the World album? Me Against the World comes out is number one on Billboard Top 100. How was you feeling, my man, when Me Against the World came out? And it was having all that success. I mean, it was it was like a a, a new feeling, you know, because we had never had anything. I mean, I think I think it dropped around the same time the E40 stuff was dropping. So, you know, me and my production company and and, and friends, and we were, you know, Sam Bosick and me, we were all just kind of like, like like on a cloud, so to speak, with you know, with success, not really knowing, you know, what I mean, how to handle it, but we just was like really excited to just be professionals finally you know and we could see we could see the the, uh, the amount of success that we were going to have as far as accolades we weren't even thinking about monies at the time we weren't even doing it for monies we just were doing it for you know to get us to the next step if i'm not mistaken when me against the world dropped tupac was in prison so was you in contact with tupac while he was in prison yes yes he would call me um he would have the record label call me and they would set up appointments for me to come back to LA and I produce songs for uh, Thug Life and he had you know he had Jasmine Guy come through and she sang on a couple of songs that I did for Thug Life and he had the Outlaws which were at the time they were called Dramacidal he had me producing songs for Dramacidal while he was in jail so I would talk to him while he was in jail off and on because um, he, he still was you know he kept his company r running you know because those were his artists so he, you know, and I was one of his uh, go-to producers. So he had me, you know, down in the studio working on all of them. What was your conversations like with Tupac while he was in prison? It was just all business. It was all, you know, I need you to produce this song for such and such. Hey, I'm going to have Jasmine Kai. You know, just a basic, it wasn't like, no, man, I'm going through it. And, you know, it wasn't nothing like that at all. It was just like a wholesome, you know, let's let's get this done. We still working. You know what I mean? Just because I'm here don't mean that we're not working no more. So he was just on some, let's get it done. I need you to do this for me. You know, just a favor. You know, me asking me, not really love a favor, but because they were paying me. You know what I mean? But he just knew that he can count. I was one of his, like I say, I was one of his producers that he wanted to produce, you know, songs, twos and, you know, twos and three songs on different little albums that he had. Did you have any idea Tupac and Jasmine guy was that close? Prior to her going to the studio singing hooks for Tupac? No, nah, I didn't I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I hadn't even realized that that he even knew her at that time. I'm just like, man, Jasmine got come through. I didn't even know she could sing. You know what I mean? She came through and she was singing. But um I didn't know it went any further. I didn't know she, what she was doing or what her role was other than coming through the studio and just singing on so I never never explored or 
never realized any of that. And when he got out, I never even asked him about her. You know, it just was like, because when you, when you around people that are like your homeboys, you don't really think about the stuff you think about years later, what you could have, would have, should have done. You know what I mean? You're just in the motion, in the moment at the time. And so you're just living, you know what I mean? You're just living day by day and just doing what you got to do. You're not really you're reading too far into certain things like we do after the fact. You know what I mean? Like right now, I read into stuff now with my friends now just because of my relationship with Pac. I, I don't take none of my real high power friends for granted that are major factors in the industry. You know what I mean? Like Floyd Mayweather is a friend of mine. So if I see him, I try and hurry up and take a picture with him. I try and talk to him as much as I possibly can because he's like major people that I know that are my, like my really friends. So I read into stuff more now than I was then. So I don't know I didn't really get into it. Hey, man, what's that guy doing? What's, what's, why is she here? I didn't really, you know what I mean? I didn't go that far into that other than she just, that's just somebody, I thought he was just somebody he, she messed with. And, you know, because he was a, he was a woman, not womanizer, you know, the ladies man. So I just figured that she, she was just another person that, you know, was just maybe his homegirl, maybe he messed with her or whatever. And she just came through and got on a few songs because he liked to help people. He liked for people to, if they had dreams and aspirations to be something, he wanted to try and help them, you know what I mean? Push the line on becoming successful. 